Hi. Good morning. And given this is, uh, hey Bruce. Oh, and nice to see you're in the, I don't, I don't know where that is, the tropics or? Lake Como. Lake Northern Como. Italy. Yeah. Uh, I that's see. not where I am. <laughs> I, well, I don't know if I should say congratulations or I'm sorry, but I'm glad you're with us. <laughs> And for everyone joining us now, hello, Michael and Amy, we will, we have made you all co-hosts. Hello, Artie, good morning. We have made you all co-hosts. So um, because this is a VIP event, we want to see you. So if you're comfortable, please share, you know, your, turn on your camera and give us the chance to see you. You could stay muted or not, depending on the noise in the background but we'll really put this together as a conversation. Hello, Mike. It is great to see everyone and hello, Michael. We have a Thank Mike you. And a Michael. Hello, Mara, how are you? I am well. It is great to see all of you. For those who didn't hear me say, since this is a small VIP event, we wanted you with us as uh, technically it'll, you'll be listed as a panelist. And then it gives you the opportunity for us all to interact, to see each other, to ask questions and to talk and as close as we can make it to a um, Fauci approved cocktail party. Hi, Lisa, uh, Linda, excuse me. And as everyone is coming on, uh, if you, most of you have probably done Zoom before, but if you haven't, um, depending on whether you're on your phone or your computer, but I, I'm gonna guess most people are on their computer, on the bottom of your screen, there's a black bar that says mute, stop video, participants, chat. You'll see a number one next to the chat. That is a message to everyone. And that's a good area to put your questions in uh, when you have them. You don't have to put your questions in there. You can speak and just ask your questions verbally. But if you did want to put them there, you're welcome to. Good morning, Allison. Good morning. Good to see you, or not see you yet, but um, <laughs> if you feel comfortable, please turn off your camera. I'd rather have people turn on their camera, excuse me, not off. I'd rather have people turn on the camera so we can see each other if you're comfortable. You feel free to remain on mute, um, but since this is a small VIP event, we want to make sure that we get to know each other a little bit. All right, sounds good. Wonderful. We'll probably start in about, thank you for arriving on time. We'll start in, in just a few seconds. We may have some others who join us, uh, probably two more people who will join us along the way. Otherwise we really want to get started. What? You can listen, okay. Great. So if you have noise in the background, stay on mute, but hopefully you can see us. And if you feel comfortable, please share your, your view and your camera. So with that, I will kick it off. If everybody's good, we'll have, a, as I said, I think we're expecting two more people to, to join after we get started. So first, let me say welcome. This is Banner's first at home together webinar and it's hosted by Banner's Alzheimer's Institute, sometimes we call it BAI, and it's focused on BAI Tucson. Well, actually we'll be talking about both. And the name of our session today is talking about my generation. My name is Mara Aspinall. I'm managing partner of Bluestone Venture Partners and um, very much dedicated to the Arizona region personally and professionally. I am very pleased to serve as your moderator for today's discussion. And I wanna thank you all for being an important part of the Banner Health and Banner's Alzheimer's Institute community of patients, friends, supporters, family. 
um, none of what we've achieved so far would be possible without you. And we really want to take this opportunity to both thank you, but also continue to educate you on the market and the offerings that um, BAI serves. Today's session is being recorded. Um, this just allows people to listen to it or for you to listen to it again. As I talked about before, this time that we're going to leave lots of time for questions because we re really rather have this like a discussion. Um, if you'd like, put your questions in the chat function. I will read them and ask our panelists. If you'd rather just, you know, literally raise your hand or just interrupt, we'll manage that too. And uh, we have this as close to that cocktail party atmosphere as possible. Um, just to give you the background, but I think all of you knew about it, um, but is to talk about what is Banner's Alzheimer's Institute. It started 14 years ago in 2006, where Banner Health established the Alzheimer's Institute. It began in Phoenix. It is now, less than 15 years later, recognized as a leader in Alzheimer's research, and most importantly, setting the new incredibly high standard of care for patients and their families. In 2020, as a result of a significant philanthropic gift, um, we opened up BAI in Tucson, including the Tool Family Memory Center, which is providing diagnosis, support, and care for patients, and very importantly, families throughout Southern Arizona. For those of us in Tucson, it's, you know, it's wonderful to have terrific medical care in Phoenix, but it's even better to have it very close to us in Tucson. So we think that the two city model with the strength that we can get to get the very best people with these two centers is the ideal scenario. So we're thrilled to have the Tool Memory Care Center here in Tucson. And if you haven't been there, particularly with COVID, we can't do tours now, but we'll talk about that. Um, later and Dr. Anderson um, will do that. But let me just talk about some of the questions that I see and that I hear when I talk in the community about Alzheimer's. You know, what is Alzheimer's? Is it normal aging? How can it really be diagnosed? Are there treatments that are working today? What can I expect? What can the family expect? What can a caregiver do? How can we better support families? So today, we're fortunate to have two experts to lead us through the discussion, um, the opportunities, the challenges that a patient, a family will, can face, and what resources are available in our community. Those two people, you've seen it on the invitation, and some of you have met them before, Dr. Alan Anderson, who's the medical director of BAI Tucson, and Hella Brand. So first, I'm who's a physician assistant and um, critical to providing the care with her staff. I'm first going to introduce Dr. Anderson um, and the tremendous value that he brings to our community. He's relatively new in Tucson, and we are so lucky to have him. He's a board-certified geriatric psychiatrist. He works specifically in the field of Alzheimer's and other related dementias. dementias. Oh. Um, he performs evaluation and treatment of patients and that is his focus area. He's also the principal investigator of many clinical trials for the disease. Um, he's not just a clinician on a day-to-day -day basis. He's been a national leader. He was president of the American Association for Geriatric, uh, Geriatric psychiatry. In 2014, he received their award for clinician of the year. He represents the society at many of the major house of delegates, including the AMA. And um, he has not just expertise in memory and cognitive disorders, but he, sir, he understands the business side too. And he has expertise in medical documentation, coding, and uh, serves on the relevant committees with the American Psychiatric Association. So with that, I'm thrilled that we were able to recruit him here and that he is the director of the Tool Family Medical Center at BAI Tucson. So with that, Dr. Anderson, let me send it over to you. 
That was great. And, and thank you for that introduction. Very gracious of you to, to comment on the many things that I feel very proud about. But I'm now especially proud to be here. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about I me. Mean, you heard that I'm a board certified geriatric psychiatrist. And it was a day when I, I treated probably over 20 years ago, a, a more broad spectrum of diseases that patients would come to, including things like depression, bipolar disorder, and other mental illness in older patients. But my focus really became Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. And I ended up uh, spending about eight years in a, in a corporation that I thought would be my final job. Sadly, and, that, and, and they had national prominence. It was the Copper Ridge Institute associated with Johns Hopkins University. And they had, uh, at the time, very national prominence in developing a model of care for dementia. Sadly, through some fiscal mismanagement, they, they decided to cut programs. And, and I, I never enjoyed working for an organization that cut clinical programs. I mean, that's what I'm about. That's what, that's what is important for patients and families. And so I, I did leave that program based on that and was looking for my next opportunity when he stumbled across the ad for this position. I was glad I stumbled across it. My wife and I were interested in perhaps relocating to somewhere warmer, not expecting to have over a hundred days of three digit weather, but it was still a, a nice change from the harsh winters of, of the Northeast. So we moved here. Um, I took over the position of director about a year ago and, and, have, and, and now think this is my home and this is gonna be the best job ever because they, they do things in the right way. And you're gonna hear some about that from me, but also a lot from Helen Brand, who's gonna talk about some of the more important aspects of family and community services. Um, I was asked to cover some things and, and I'd like to cover some of those. First of all, I, I did set a personal mission a few years ago, and that was as follows, to work with talented and passionate people uh, to improve the lives of individuals with dementia and their family members. And this aligns with, with what we do at BAI, both in Phoenix and in Tucson. BAI's mission is threefold. One, to end Alzheimer's without losing another generation, which is also an Alzheimer's Association mission. Two, to set a national standard for patient and family care. And this is important. This is really at the heart and soul of what I believe we need to do. The most important piece uh, of, of the care we give to patients involves this. And then three, uh, the third part of the mission is to forge new models of collaboration biomedical research. Now, uh, that's been going on in, in Phoenix for some time. I will tell you that we are now getting into that here in Tucson. We're gonna be starting two clinical trials very soon, and that'll be an option for people that, to be able to stay locally and be involved in that rather than to have to travel, for instance, to Phoenix. Um, to cover a few things, and I apologize if some of you are, are well informed about dementia and know some of this already, and, and certainly I'd be glad to answer higher level questions. Uh, try to stop me if you want to, that's fine, uh, when we get to the Q&A piece. But you know, there, there is a difference between normal aging and what we call dementia. And, and many of us, I mean, I'm in the baby boomer age and, and getting to the age where we maybe forget names more readily. You know, we see somebody, we should know their name, it's on the tip of the tongue, we can't come up with it. Or, or maybe we go into a room and misplace something and, and wonder why we went into that room and, and we walk away and then we up, oh, now I know why I went into the room. These are little slips that occur with normal aging. They don't really interfere in any significant way with our day-to-day -day activities. The difference with dementia is to get a diagnosis of dementia means that your cognitive problems have now led to some disability, some inability to perform some aspect in your daily life. And so that interference with normal activity is crossing the threshold between maybe normal aging or, or being normal and then entering into a dementia diagnosis. Uh, I also like to cover this question. What is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? And some people equate the two. So, so dementia is actually in medicine what we call a syndrome. A syndrome is a collection of signs and symptoms. And basically the syndrome of dementia means as an adult, you lose some cognitive ability. And as a result of losing that cognitive ability, you have some problems in your daily functioning. Now, there is one type of dementia where it may not be as, as uh, focused on cognition, uh, but it may be focused more on behavior. And so you can have sometimes a behavioral manifestations, and that's very common in a disorder called frontotemporal dementia. Uh, but Alzheimer's is just one 
part of what dementia is. It's one type of dementia. So when we start to, when we say dementia, we're not specifying what's the cause of it. It's just a syndrome. When we say that someone has Alzheimer's disease or another common dementia, Lewy body dementia, which you may know about based on some recent issues with uh, uh, one of the celebrities that, that came out uh, to be having this disease and a, a documentary on him. Um, but that's another common form of dementia, vascular dementia, which is either due to multiple strokes or some sort of vascular disease process. Uh, sometimes it's narrowing these tiny arteries to the brain. And, and then you have frontal temporal dementia. And then you get beyond that and, and there's some rare forms of dementia and also some medical causes. So we've seen patients who have severe depression in old age have actually a dementia. The dementia is due to the depression. You treat the depression adequately and the dementia can and often does resolve. And then there's medical other conditions like vitamin B12 deficiency or hypothyroidism or metabolic disorders. So we wanna recognize those and treat those in order to restore the person's cognitive ability. And that's the importance of having a place to go to where you have clinicians that are well-trained in diagnosis and managing the disease. I can't tell you how many times people get incorrectly diagnosed. And for instance, Lewy body dementia, we used to think if you dial the clock back 10 to 20 years, that that was a very rare form of dementia. And it was partly because people weren't asking the right questions. They weren't doing a full thorough neurologic exam. They weren't taking the time to see the patient. One of the things we learned in medical school is most of your diagnoses can be made if you take a good history and do a good quality physical exam. And in this case, also a neurologic exam. But you have to have time to do that. And some of the physicians in practice today are so pressed that they're just not spending enough time to capture all the details to get to that precise diagnosis. Now at BAI, in addition to physicians that are seeing patients and also our physician assistant, Helen, we have a nurse practitioner. We do have other people. One of the, the other key persons here involved in the professional role is our neuropsychologist, Dr. Ashish. And one of the, the neat things about Dr. Ashish is not only is he very uh, expertise in doing the neuropsychological testing, which can help us when we're not sure of the diagnosis, but he is also designing a new intervention, a cognitive intervention for people who may have normal age-related cognitive problems, what we call mild cognitive impairment, which is a stage before Alzheimer's disease or may have very early Alzheimer's disease. And already having started that, we're seeing great success with some of the patients who entered into that. So we had that expertise. And then I'm not gonna spend time on it because you're gonna hear from the Hella, what I consider to be one of the most important parts of our organization and approach to care, which is our family and community services. You know, Alzheimer's disease itself is a common disease. Um, and what, one of the commonest and the major risk factors is age because people don't get Alzheimer's at a young age. They get Alzheimer's typically more so after age 65, although there are early onset Alzheimer's that can occur at younger ages. Um, and, and so it's important that we look at the numbers here because some estimates have been that if you live up to 85, perhaps 50% of people will have some form of dementia. Uh, other conservative numbers would be 33% or a third. And even if you go with that conservative number, that means that two thirds of the population, if we live long enough, will be affected because you have the patient, right? That's one third. And then they're likely going to be married or in a relationship with a significant other partner. And that person's going to be affected. So we really have to pay attention to the needs of the family here because they, this is a stressful disease. Some of you that know that because you know people, maybe sadly you may have family members afflicted with it, but it is a disease that takes a toll on family caregivers. And to not pay attention to that is, is not giving the, the, the treatment that one needs. And so we're very proud of the fact that we have this very comprehensive coordinated treatment. And, and so we start with a good diagnosis, right? We have the patient come in, they see one of our physicians, uh, they get a thorough history and physical and neurologic exam. Uh, we may have some testing that's done in advance, but if not, we will order some blood tests to rule out those metabolic or medical causes. We will also likely get some form of a neuroimaging study if it's not already done. And, and typically that's an MRI of the brain. And then we'll have a, a second meeting to call together that information and, and try to give the patient, if we can, 
the, a precise diagnosis. And I say, if we can, I mean, we're, we're aware that there are some times that we get, you know, stumped a bit with the patient that has some conflicting symptoms that don't seem to fit the mold of, of any of the particular types. And that's when we're going to take advantage of our neuropsychologist, perhaps other tests. There are some, some newer imaging tests that can help differentiate types of dementia. One example is a, a skin. It can help differentiate between frontotemporal dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Um, and, and by the way, this is an area that, that Banner and Phoenix has been uh, associated with, which is the, the onslaught of new testing that's going to come out for Alzheimer's disease, including not too far in the future, some, some form of blood test that will have some, some better predictive value. But the importance of getting the right diagnosis is that the treatments can vary. The medications used in Alzheimer's disease, they don't work in frontotemporal dementia. Some of them do work in Lewy body dementia. But we, we need to be specific to give the patient and their family some understanding of what the disease is and what the progression may be like. And that's why we hope that people would come in at a relatively early stage, uh, because there's a lot of work we can do through our family community service folks in terms of planning. You know, we want to make sure people have capacity to do things like wills, advanced directives. Uh, and, and by the way, just commenting on advanced directives, the most important thing is that people would get a healthcare power of attorney. I can't tell you how, how much that's important. And sadly, if people wait on that and they get to like a middle stage of the disease, they may lack then the capacity to sign those forms. And I can tell you that lawyers make a lot of money on some of these court cases where you have families arguing whether or not someone has capacity or not when they sign documents. So it's important to plan, it's important to project ahead on what lies ahead in the future, and then provide the family and the patient with the best treatment available. Um, many of you may, some of you may be familiar with some things that happen out there in the real world, uh, which is seeing a doctor and saying, doctor saying to the patient, yeah, you have Alzheimer's disease, here's some medicine, see you in a year, good luck. You know, don't let the door hit you, you know, in the behind, so to speak. That's not the approach we want for our families. We want a comprehensive approach that helps them navigate this disease, that gives them some hope. It's not a great disease to have. We have no cure yet. We do have some treatments that are promising in what's called disease modifying. Maybe questions can come up about that, but we don't have a cure. But that doesn't mean that we can't offer some hope for improving the quality of life. And that's gonna be a major topic for Heller to cover in a few minutes. Um, I think I've covered most of the things, uh, and maybe there are some questions that come up, Mara, during the, the question and answer period. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Anderson. That was incredibly useful. There are already a question about MCI and whether that always leads to Alzheimer's or not, and I have a couple of questions, but let's hear from Hella, and then we'll come back to that and have a discussion. So I hope that works for everyone. Uh, again, we structure this as very short talks, so then we can answer questions and really focus on what you want to talk about. So with that, let me introduce Hella Brand. She is a physician assistant, and most importantly, and you heard this from Dr. Anderson, she doesn't focus on one aspect of the patient, but really talks about the whole patient experience, treating the body, the mind, the soul of patients, and working with their families in a way that is effective. effective. As we all know, Alzheimer's doesn't just impact um, an individual, it affects their loved ones, it affects their family, it affects their friends. She has experience with dementia as a former physical therapist who specialized in the care of older people and cognitively disabled. She serves to give the tools for living with dementia to give caregiver support, and again, this whole body person directed care. As a PA at BAI, she works with families and patients in setting the standard of treatment for that particular patient. What I have learned from Hella and I have um, heard her speak several times is there is no one treatment protocol. The treatment protocols are customized for what works for individual patients. Um, she's a noted lecturer. Again, like Dr. Anderson, this is not 
These are not just people who have worked here, but these are people who are well known in the Alzheimer's community more broadly nationwide. And she is a noted lecturer and sought after speaker, um, particularly working with the Native American and rural communities. Um, she's got a great educational background and we are thrilled to have Hella as part of BAI and in particular BAI Tucson. So with that, Hella, let me hand it over to you. Okay, thanks, Mara. That was very kind of you. So I want to just quickly um, comment, you know, I think the topic today talking about my generation is just so imp important and appropriate because at, at this point in our lives, in one way or another, we probably all have been touched by someone with dementia, either in our family or our circle of friends, or it's become a more uh, predominant concern even for our own well-being. This, this has become the greatest fear people have entering into old age, if, if you would. So I think it's important to have the dialogue and it's why we're so passionate about what we do at any given point. Um, and then I wanna just tell you uh, kind of two patient stories to um, kind of review why I am where I am. So one is a lady whose um, husband died when she was about 80 and she lived for three years on her own despite being almost completely blind. Uh, and then family started to notice some forgetfulness and then some safety concerns in the house. Um, and then changes in her thought processes, becoming a little bit more suspicious, more confused, um, ultimately moving her into the house with them, her daughter and um, son-in-law. But um, there had always been kind of a, a strained relationship. Um, and ultimately, they ended up placing her. This is the lady who, over about an eight-year span, lost her command of three different languages. So she lost English first, she lost um, Estonian next, and she lost Russian last, um, and then was completely unable to speak, unable to walk, very childlike in her demeanor. Um, fast forward to another person, um, a number of uh, siblings had noticed that their uh, uh, father seemed to be having more trouble coming up with words, um, but hit or miss, um, never observed by the oldest daughter when uh, she spoke to him. Um, but there were changes in personality uh, for somebody who was an engineer, very analytical. He became a little bit more disinhibited. Um, all of a sudden, he was interested in um, psychics, getting readings. Um, he was giving away money, um, falling prey to the, you know, if you send us $5,000, you uh, will hold your place in line uh, for a million dollar uh, winning. And as soon as he would send that off, another letter would come. So changes in judgment and reasoning, more forgetful over time. Um, and then really having the usual concerns in terms of driving safety. So um, driving to Florida, he wasn't sure of his exit. So he stopped in the middle of I-95 to try and figure that out, which I don't know if any of you have ever driven that corridor, but that's a really scary one. So I bring those to you because those are my family. And there's a difference of about 20 years in there. Uh, so the first one was my grandmother. Um, and at that time, um, this was in the 80s, uh, for three or four years, it was presumed normal aging. Uh, that was still very much the mentality because it was the late 70s that we really started to research and understand dementia more and Alzheimer's disease. And um, that was at a time in my work as a physical therapist that we didn't work with these patients because they were hopeless. They, they couldn't learn. Uh, 20 years later, uh, my father um, is, is the second person, and I was in a position to help. That doesn't mean that my family recognized my expertise at that point. Um, as many families know, uh, they all have their own assumptions. They all know what's best, and they're just going to do it their way. But um, And he had remarried uh, with a woman who caused estrangement within the family, and that made it difficult. So 
even though I'm an expert in the field, it doesn't mean that I don't appreciate what families have gone through, but we were all ultimately able to get on the same page with him to help my um, siblings and even his wife learn the kinder, gentler ways we've learned to interact with patients over the years. Um, so I'm not seeing the slides. Are those coming up, Lisa? There. So um, I'm just going to kind of keep talking here, but um, just to kind of summarize some of what Dr. Anderson said. So the first part of the, the journey is, is really in some ways the most difficult, and that's just accepting that there is something going on. We don't want to believe that our loved ones or ourselves are experiencing memory loss and changes. So getting to the point of um, having a, a workup and a diagnosis made makes a big, big difference. Um, and I think the important thing about Vanner Alzheimer's, um, as you may have um, surmised from what Dr. Anderson said, is there's a broad background um, of people on our team here. So uh, normally people would see a neurologist and that's it. Here you see uh, potentially a psychiatrist or a neurologist, uh, myself who straddles kind of the clinical and the family uh, community side, nurse practitioners, social workers, and we all bring different backgrounds to it. So it really makes it an exciting and dynamic area to be working in because it's not just multidisciplinary, but also interdisciplinary. We work hard to create the dementia culture so that every opportunity any of us has with family is one about connection and teaching. Um, and so once the diagnosis has been made, um, then it's time to say, okay, while there is a common pathway in terms of dementia and, uh, progression and, and what we can expect over time, everybody has relative strengths and weaknesses. Each family has its unique challenges, um, its own strengths and weaknesses. So what are their needs and goals? How do we accommodate them? How do we move them to a point of realistic expectations? How do we um, get them to realize how they can impact quality of um, life? So it's, it's beginning to establish sort of a uh, what to expect, uh, what to do to make it the best um, along the way, and, and some education about prognosis as well. Um, and the, re the treatment options in that are really about addressing not only the cognitive symptoms, but the symptoms that are often associated with dementia. So it's not just a memory issue, it's uh, language, it's uh, judgment and reasoning, problem solving, it's uh, changes in behavior and personality. So we see a lot of depression, anxiety, agitation, anger, um, paranoia, any number of um, behavioral changes and how do we work with that. And then again, one of the um, unique aspects of our program when we talk about setting a new standard of care is that research is now accepted as a standard of care, offering that to people. So to be able to come to a clinic and have access to um, not just the doctors for diagnosis and management, but uh, to participate in clinical research trials, and then to have the family and community um, services aspect, I think, is what really sets us apart right from the first moment somebody steps in. Um, and then the rest is really, how do we um, help caregivers become the best caregivers that they can be? And that means being educated so that they understand they don't get blindsided by what they see, they feel empowered to work with it, and I think most importantly, they learn how to advocate for their person. Next slide, please. There, okay. So um, the particular focus, obviously, um, with dementia, there are lots and lots of safety concerns. Um, people who can't manage their medications, who are out still driving, how do we help them um, let go of uh, driving? They're living alone. We see this an awful lot. Um, so how do we optimize their safety, their general welfare, realizing that when there is um, 
general psychological comfort in terms of feeling safe in their setting and being safe in their setting, we tend to see a reduction in behavior and mood um, features. So this is critical um, for their overall welfare. Uh, dignity is an important part of this. Independence, that walking the line and preserving autonomy um, as much as possible in early stages, but setting the realistic expectation that this is going to change and we're going to need to provide more support over time for the person. Um, how do we preserve relationships? If we have somebody who's angry and agitated um, and is not allowing uh, family to participate in care, how can we work with that? So I have one lady who comes to the appointments on her own, maybe with a, a home care companion. She is fully angry at her son and daughter, believes that they have done her wrong by any number of ways, um, and doesn't realize that they are in the background orchestrating everything. They talk to the doctors, they talk to the care providers, they've accepted that this is what she believes of them, but they continue to watch out for her welfare. Um, and slowly over time between coaching on how to um, appropriately communicate, um, medication management is needed. Um, we've been able to foster some relationships and interaction. Uh, the same with the daughter who came home thinking she would bring mom home back to Indiana for a visit for Christmas last year and came home and found a very angry, paranoid woman um, and didn't feel that she could take her back to the grandchildren. But over three months, we were able to work together and um, successfully not only got mom to Indiana, we moved her to Indiana and to uh, successfully adjust to living in an uh, assisted living facility. So these are the kinds of scenarios that come up. Um, and my particular focus is always, how do we impact quality of life? How do we bring joy? How do we find laughter in a, a given day? So. Next. Okay. Oh, perfect. So, we'll see you. Yeah. Can you see it? Okay. So, you know, the, the unique aspect of working with dementia for families is this is uncharted waters. Uh, nothing really quite prepares you for managing something like this. And so um, Dr. Anderson alluded to um, how we navigate these uh, waters um, and any of our tools that we have created for our families are all built on kind of a, a premise of navigation. So you'll see compasses and maps and things like that. Okay, next slide, Lisa. Okay, so the main thing is life does not end where dementia begins. I believe that strongly. It's a hard diagnosis to hear um, to adjust to, but I, I'm here to tell you that people do this every day and that even as they progress through their dementia, people still speak to a wish to want to um, be with family, uh, to want to live at home, um, express gratitude for family. So they do adjust as do the um, caregivers. So once uh, a diagnosis has been made, um, patients get or families get referred on to me or our social worker. And now the job really starts. What do we need to focus on? And each stage has kind of critical needs. So in that early stage, it is about making sure that the voice of the person with dementia is heard. Let's get your wishes down on paper. If if something happened to you health-wise, who would you want to pick as your uh, proxy? Um, so getting those healthcare directives um, and powers of attorney done, um, planning for things like driving cessation, because what's hardest is when one day somebody can drive and the next day they can't. It's much kinder if we've had the dialogue from day one and have had families learn to um, put in place strategies that gradually offload driving. So how can we make that happen? Um, 
So this is something that is unique to our program. Um, and as I said, it's myself, um, a social worker, and we have a whole team that is devoted to um, providing educational classes, doing support groups and counseling programs for, um, in some cases, the person with dementia and um, in others for family members and some opportunities even through our dementia friendly outreach um, to bring the, the two groups together, um, caregivers Thank and you. those with dementia. Um, so, yeah. Sorry, Hella, I don't know if you were, I didn't mean to interrupt you who are wrapping up so we can get to questions or- Yep, I'm wrapping I, up. I interrupted you before the end, apologies. Okay, yeah, okay. So um, I think, you know, another aspect that is unique to us is our um, novel outreach and life enrichment programs. So partnering with people in the community to bring art programs, music programs um, to people that uh, the families can participate in together. Um, you heard about some of our Native American outreach. I've been blessed to be a big part of that. Um, uh, the big culmination of which is our annual Native American conference, uh, 300 people a year um, at no charge to the Native American communities. Um, and all of this comes about because there's been um, so much support um, through philanthropic and through uh, grant supported um, outreach. So, so that's it, we can open the next slide is just a summary. Perfect. Well, let's um, let's leave the summary on the sheet so everyone can see that and then open it up for questions. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Hella. Those were fantastic um, presentations and overviews. While everybody's thinking about questions, sorry, um, while everybody's thinking about questions, um, let me ask you the first one, Dr. Anderson, that came into the chat which is, um, tell us about mild cognitive impairment. Does MCI always lead to Alzheimer's? And I'll add to that, is Alzheimer's uh, always come on gradually through MCI first? So if you could talk about mild cognitive impairment, that would be terrific. Sure, I'll answer the first, the last, one of the questions first. MCI, mild cognitive impairment, does not always lead to Alzheimer's. Um, different studies have looked at this and find somewhere between about a third to maximally about 50% of people with MCI may progress eventually to have an Alzheimer's diagnosis. So it, in some people, it's an end result and they don't go beyond it. And then some people about a third to a half do go beyond and develop actual dementia. The real differentiation is what's impacted. Um, Normal aging related cognitive changes, if people were to take tests like through our neuropsychologist, they would be average scores and probably not below average in any areas. People with MCI score below average. So they actually have some objective evidence more so than normal age related changes, some objective evidence of cognitive decline. But the differentiation is, is MCI does not impair their day-to-day -day activities. So. That's how it differentiates itself. Um, there are things that we might do to improve our odds of not going from MCI onto Alzheimer's. Sort of a topic for a whole nother seminar, which I'd love well, to give someday. It's a prevention of cognitive decline. Well, that, that, I'll leave that as my answer for your questions. Well, perfect lead in though, because the next question that came through, I'm not gonna use names, but please feel free if I'm not doing your question um, appropriately interrupt is are there lifestyle modifications to prevent Alzheimer's? I would say for myself, that's what we all think about. Um, what can we do now for ourselves or for our family to be as protected as possible? Absolutely, and having had to travel recently, I always go to the magazine stores and I'm always looking at what might my patients or families read. So the New York Times just put out one of these like 14.99 kind of supplements on memory. And I found some of that very interesting. This is a topic that would really deserve a longer answer. Um, I mean, the short answer quickly is exercise, diet, manage your hypertension, your diabetes, your hypercholesterolemia, um, stay active socially, uh, maintain a purpose in life, make sure you sleep well, 
but I, I'm not doing a good service to just listing these things. I will tell you that the best diet, in my opinion, is something called the MIND diet, M-I-N-D. You can find it on the internet. Um, and, and stay tuned and maybe what we'll do, Hazel, is put together another talk at some point in time for these lovely people to hear, hear the full story about this. Well, thank you. It sounds like if I'm stating this right, there's no uh, magic bullet or magic pill here, but there are some things that might be helpful. And if nothing else, they're probably good for your general health. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, and the two other important things is stop smoking if you're a smoker. And secondly, don't drink excessively. Uh, there's some research to show something like one glass of red wine a day may be beneficial to the brain. But if you're not drinking anything, I wouldn't start drinking red wine. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, the basics. I think I would just add to that, um, you know, it's, it's staying mentally um, alert, but I think the important thing is to remain um, curious and inquisitive in life because then we challenge ourselves to do new learning. And that's one of the things that's a strong um, stimulus for some kind of brain uh, protective mechanism. That is great. Thank you for that. And so I have, I have another question and keep sending the questions in. Um, as Helen described, um, and Dr. Anderson, you said this, this is a very integrative uh, view and that BAI takes this integrated whole body view. Why are there so few other centers that do this? You know, when you hear it, it sounds obvious. So and why so there, are we one of the few? Yeah, because and, and this is at the heart and soul of, of what we need to change in our country. So, you know, our, our health system is disease oriented, right? It's you wait till somebody gets sick enough that they need to see a doctor. Well, we need to change that. And part of what we're thinking about it at Banner Alzheimer's is how we incorporate things in order to one, help prevent decline, cognitive decline in dementia, but also to manage it better with this comprehensive approach. But to get to the gist of, of your question, one of the reasons why more comprehensive centers don't exist, and mostly the ones that do exist are more academic centers at university centers, is because the funding through Medicare. Again, Medicare was created to treat disease states, not to prevent, not to keep people healthy. And we're gonna turn that whole system around once we get to what we call population health, which we keep talking about, I believe it'll be in my lifetime, but we are developing models at BAI. So when we do go to population health, we will be at the forefront of providing what's needed. And population health you know, gives reimbursements for disease states, for what are called bundled payments. So if you're really doing it well, you save a lot of money because you're doing it on the front end and making people healthier and, and needing less expensive care through a very comprehensive model of care. But unfortunately, that's not something reimbursable. So when I tried to sell this model in, in my home state before I found this ad for Banner, all the health systems were saying, this is gonna lose us money. We don't wanna do that. We'd rather do neurosurgery and orthopedic surgery and make some money. So it, it really is somewhat economic as to why people don't open more of these. Well, we probably don't have enough time, but I think today, cause I have there are a bunch of other questions that came in, but one question is, does that mean it's more expensive for the families? How do, how does that work? And if not today, can people follow up with you? Cause that may be a very personal question as to how payment is done for a family member who comes into the center. Yeah, and I'm gonna let Hella answer some of this, but I wanna say that, you know, Hazel and Mara, please share my email address with these folks. I'd love to have, you know, one of the things I'm missing is not seeing you in person. I thank you for being on Zoom, but, but I'm a people person, you know, and I really miss that opportunity to have you sitting in front of me, right? Hopefully at some point we will tackle this COVID stuff to get to the point that we can do more in person because we've got this great education room, this great library, but we can't even use it right now. And it's very sad that, that we just have these resources that are sort of put on hold. But please, whenever we get the opportunity, I welcome you to tour here. I'll be glad to meet with you. We can probably do lunch in our conference room and socially distance if anybody wanted to do something like that. So think about that. But Helen, you might be able to expand on this comprehensive care and, and saving money and, 
and being actually less expensive for families and our, and our national Medicare system if we do it right. I'll let Helen expand. Yeah. So first off, um, most of our people qualify under Medicare, so they do get covered for their visit. Um, and then we recognize virtually all of the other um, insurances that are out there. But a big part of this too is to look at models, um, you know, some of the uh, support group models, for instance, on ambiguous loss in caregivers. And if you, uh, bring caregivers together on this topic and address the, the grief and or depression they may be feeling, now you're saving um, money in the long run. If we're working with families to recognize um, signs and symptoms of delirium, a sudden change in mental status um, related to some underlying medical issue, and we can get them to their primary care um, for a quick evaluation and response rather than to send them to an emergency room that is um, confusing, disorienting, and distressing to them. Um, are we saving more money in the long run? So managing the associated symptoms on both, both sides, the person with dementia and the, and the caregiver, um, how is that impacting the health system? So We've got lots of little subsets that we look at that, but I think there's um, room for more of that. I would add the one um, answer to uh, why are there not so many models. The other is, as Dr. Anders said, it's not a glory field, um, but I think, again, what sets us apart is a, a, a recognition of the need to educate more medical providers and to Kind of lure people into the field. So you do that by having fellowships and bringing residents in and medical students. Um, um, I've had PA students in the past um, and really broaden their understanding. So even if they're community-based, they know what to do with dementia and not just, oh, we have to send to the specialist. Yeah, no, and I will comment, I'm kind of glad it's not a glory field and paid very highly because then you'd have people that would just do it for the money. Right yeah. now, you have people yeah. that do it because it's their passion. Yeah, so I'm glad yeah they're not here to do a job, it is a passion. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for the two of you having a passion with your teams. Mm -hmm. Another question that comes up a lot is clinical trials. How does somebody get into a prevention trial if they are concerned or they, for, for whatever reason? How do patients get into clinical trials of new drugs? Do you sponsor that in Tucson and Phoenix? At, how does that work? And what is the time frame that somebody, well, I'll get to time frame afterwards. How does that work and how can people join potential trials? So, so we are, as I mentioned, starting two clinical trials over the next month or so. We'll hopefully be screening people within a week for the first trial. Um, the trials we are doing are treatment trials for people who have uh, dementia. So uh, our, uh, our treatment trials, right? Treatment trials, yes. Okay. So, so the, the first one we're going to start is an infusion study. Uh, these infusions are thought to act in a way that may indeed change the way the disease progresses. We call that disease modifying. Um, and in the second trial we're doing, it's kind of an exciting one that I, I think is kind of unique, is we're going to be involved in a microbiome study. So this is a study that helps correct some problems that are going on in our microbiomes, which has been studied and shown to affect the brain. Uh, and so that's kind of a very unique so, uh, treatment. I, I do, I have a, a, a interest in prevention. So I do think as we continue to expand our clinical trials, I would love us to, to get more involved in some prevention trials at some point. And just one comment for those who are not familiar with the microbiome, while the skin has a microbiome and otherwise most of the discussion is around the microbiome of the gut and what we eat um, and the microbiome maybe we're born with or maybe we develop over time um, interacts with that and creates a different atmosphere that may impact lots of diseases. So just to emphasize that on the microbiome. Um, we got another, so thank you. We got another question about how are you dealing with this comprehensive approach during COVID? Dr. Anderson spoke about the fact that it's hard to meet in person. Um, we were originally gonna have a very different event in my home and we're not doing that. So 
how are you dealing with this? Are you treating patients now? Are you seeing patients now? Can people still work with you in this COVID time? I'll let Helen answer that. Go ahead, Helen. Yes, so we are seeing some people live in the clinic. Um, we're finding over the last several weeks that more families are wanting to re-engage because it's hard to do um, an e-visit, a video visit, or a phone visit with someone dementia, with dementia because you need that person-to-person -person, um, connection. Um, so we, we've had the three formats. Um, I think the challenge has been to help caregivers stay afloat um, during all of this. Um, being kind of cooped up in a house has presented unique challenges um, because the person with dementia has gotten more settled and settled and settled in the routine of the couch uh, rather than what was going on pre-COVID. And so teaching them how to, caregivers, how to create movement within the house, for instance. So we move from activity to activity and foster some, um, encouraging them to do their own media uh, contact with family and friends rather than feel isolated. Because uh, we certainly have seen depression, anxiety, and agitation increase on both sides of the um, equation. Super. Um, other, other questions that we have? We probably have time for one other question. I have another one here. Um, how, what kind of time frame? I mentioned time from earlier and Dr. Anderson, you talked about diagnosis and the, the balance there. What kind of time frame should a patient, should a family expect once they start talking to you to get some sort of clarity on diagnosis and how to move forward? Understanding it's personalized, but just give us a range of what the expectations should be. Yeah, so, and that can be very variable. I mean, for instance, there are some people that come in that all the diagnostic studies that I might need to rule out other things are done. So they already come in with neuroimaging, a full set of blood tests. You know, it may be pretty clear by the family history, by the history the patient gives, uh, that it, it's a case of Alzheimer's. Now, you know, I, it's not common that I would, would have that in every patient. There are some patients that it may take several visits before there's a comfort level in saying, this is what I think is going on. And so it really can vary from getting some feedback at the initial visit or having uh, several follow-up visits, but we really hope that within several visits, we're given something to the family that gives them some understanding of the underlying disease. And, and then at that point, you know, getting them hooked up with the appropriate services uh, that we offer for the comprehensive treatment. And does it, um, can you get clarity? You know, th there's been a lot of discussion, um, both in the public, in the broad media or otherwise, that it's very hard to make a diagnosis. You talk about dementia as a syndrome. Is it possible to get clarity? Um, you know, again, hard to answer, but is it 20, 40, 80% of people that you can make a clear diagnosis of what it is and what it isn't? Yeah, and, and again, a lot of times people come with a fair amount of information. So they may have gone to their family doctor, uh, primary care physician, and I have that information in front of me. I, it's hard to say. I would say at least a third of the time, I'm pretty confident that, that at a, a visit or two that uh, I have the, the diagnosis. Um, it may even be more like 50% of those cases. And then in some cases, I refer the patient to see our neuropsychologist because there are some where I wanna get some advanced studies. Like I mentioned, there are some other scans. So I might wanna do a PET scan. And I recently had a case where I was trying to decide between uh, Alzheimer's dementia and, and a form of frontotemporal dementia, which is a, a, even a more rare form of a language variant. And, and there were hints in the history that said, you know, maybe this is an Alzheimer's, maybe this is this other form. And so I sent the patient for testing or psych testing, and that's a little bit of a delay, about a month or so. And then I got those results back. I added a, a what's called a FDG PET scan, which looks at how the brain functions. And both the neuropsych testing and the FDG PET scan showed classic features of language variant of a frontotemporal dementia. So, you know, it, like I said, it varies case by case. There are some patients that 
and, and for instance, when people come in late in the game, what I mean, probably like past 80, um, there are data to show that they have multiple processes going on. Actually, one of the researchers at Banner up in Phoenix, a pathologist has shown that as, as you go every five years or so from 65 on up, there's more pathology going on in the brain. So to find an 85 year old that all they have going on in the brain is Alzheimer's disease is actually unlikely. You'll see vascular disease, you'll see elements of, of what causes Lewy body disease in the pathology. You'll see what's called tau pathology that is what we see in, in frontal temporal dementias and some other rare states of, of dementia. So really when you get to older age groups, you're probably more likely dealing with a, a mixture of, of, of underlying etiologies. So thank you for that. We've reached the end of our time. So in about 30 seconds, I'll just summarize to thank Dr. Anderson, um, Dr. Brand, the Hella Brand for being here and for giving us such articulate sense of what BAI is doing, the commitment to the patient, to the community and to all of our families. I want to express thanks to the Tool family and so many others in, in Southern Arizona, really throughout Arizona that made the Tucson campus possible so that we have our own BAI here um, and the continued strength of BAI Phoenix. And I'd ask you to save the date for the November 12th program, which will, which will be a smaller event, but a little bit bigger than today because it's a larger audience that will talk about Alzheimer's prevention. And that's led by Dr. Eric Ryman and Dr. Pierre Terrio. Um, we'll make sure if you haven't already that you get an invitation to that event. So I wanna thank you all for your patience, for the chance to be here. Hella, can I share your email address? Absolutely. So in the chat, um, everyone has it. You can get in touch with me or Hazel, but it's basically first name dot last name at Banner Health. If you wanna get in touch with Dr. Anderson, Hella Brand, um, we'd love to stay and keep in touch and thank you for being part of our first home together education sessions and hope to see you in person um, one way or another on the screen or live and uh, everyone stay well. Yes. You too, Mara. Thank you. Thank you all.